wordistruth.com. It's also listed at the bottom of the handout, which again is in the back. Uh, we're having about 2,000 different visitors come to our website each week now. Our goal this year is to have 100,000 people come to the website. And each page they download has the gospel at the bottom of it. So uh, we're getting lots of people coming, and people are watching this class. Not just the people here, but throughout the week, we're getting emails from people who are watching uh, the videos, listening to the audio of this class throughout the week. Uh, so greetings to them as well. <laughs> um, let's begin with a prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come together. We're thankful for your word, Father, and our prayers that as your people, we will be a people who delight in your word, who study it, who proclaim it, who live it. Father, we are thankful for this power of prayer, and we pray also that we will be a praying people who turn to you, both in good times and bad times, to show, show you our great need for you, Father. We are thankful most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, and we, and we are thankful for his great sacrifice. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Let's also look at verse 20. What does verse 19 mean when it says that the virgins were gathered together the second time? Well, some think we're having a flashback to the time before Esther was selected and that we're looking back in time a little bit. I think the better explanation is that we're actually seeing a second gathering of them. And one of the commentators, I think, gave a, a pretty good reason for that. It may be that the king is having this this procession of the unsuccessful contestants just to, to highlight Esther's beauty, to once again show Esther in comparison to these others. I think that's the most likely explanation for why we're having a second gathering. Uh, notice that Mordecai is sitting at the king's gate. That tells us something very important about Mordecai. I think that tells us he was by now an official of some sort. Um, one commentator suggests that when Esther became queen, she may have put Matt Mordecai in this position as perhaps a judge or a magistrate. But he is sitting at the king's gate, which tells us he's an official. The king's gate was not just a gate. It was also a building. It was a very large building. It had a gate within it, but it was kind of the, uh, the, the, the legislative, civil, commercial, business, all everything kind of centered around the king's gate. And if you remember your handout from last week, uh, you can still see the foundations of the king's gate. That's been uncovered. You can see the very spot where all this was happening. Uh, as I looked at the video and was preparing it from last week, I noted that I had said Susa's in Turkey. It's not. I, I've been reading a book on Turkey. I must have Turkey on the brain. Susa is in Iran. In fact, you can see that on your handout. It's down there near the border with Iraq. Um, this... This king's gate consisted of a central hall with side buildings, and you would have to go through this as you approach the king. So Mordecai and the other officials were standing between you and the king if you were going to try to approach the king, um, uninvited or not. We'll see that that's an issue later in the book of Esther. Uh, in verse 20, we're again reminded of Mordecai's command to Esther that she not reveal her identity. Uh, keep in mind the theme of reversal in this book. At the beginning of the book, Mordecai is giving Esther commands. At the end of the book, Esther will be giving Mordecai commands. We'll see a big reversal there. Verses 21 through 23. The details in Esther, such as the names of the eunuchs in verse 21, I think further confirms that what we're reading here is history. If we're saying someone just made this up, then we're having to assume they just made up all of these names of these eunuchs who were around the Persian court. Uh, these names were likely recorded in the court records of the time. Uh, why did these two eunuchs become so angry? Why were they going to try to kill King Xerxes? Well, we're not told. But remember that, that between the events we're looking at here and the events of chapter 1, we had Xerxes' unsuccessful campaign against the Greeks. He came home humiliated. He came home practically bankrupt. And I think most people think that the reason these two eunuchs were so upset had something to do with that, um, that, that, that this unsuccessful battle against the Greeks. In fact, we know the king was later killed uh, for similar reasons. They were eventually were successful. Um, Mordecai hears of this plot because he's at the king's gate. He's been put in that position. Again, we may see the providence of God there working to put Mordecai in just the right position. He hears of the plot. He tells Esther... Esther tells the king, the conspirators are hanged. 
And these events are then recorded in the book of the Chronicles of the King. Herodotus tells us that Xerxes did have such a book. And in fact, Herodotus tells us that the, the king's secretaries were told to record uh, in that book any time they saw one of the king's officers doing something heroic, something good. They'd write it down in the book, which I think is a remarkable uh, confirmation of what we're seeing here as well. Verse 22 tells us something very important about Esther. Uh, you know, as we've said, we, don't really, we can't really look into her mind in this book. We're not told what she's thinking. We have to look at what she's doing. And we see something in verse 22 about Esther. She gave credit where credit was due. Uh, she didn't take all the honor upon herself. She said, no, this had come from Mordecai. And yes, there are some lessons for us there. The obvious one is we should you know, give credit where credit is due. But there's a second lesson there. And that is our seemingly small acts of integrity sometimes have huge impacts on our lives and on the lives of others. This may not have seemed that important to Esther at the time. Well, I could take the honor, I could tell Mor you know, Mordecai did it, but that is going to have a huge impact on how these events turn out. So that, that's, that, I think, is a lesson for us as well and does tell us something about Esther. Esther chapter 3, verse 1. The villain takes the stage in chapter 3. Jews today continue to celebrate the Feast of Purim that we're going to read about in, in here in the book of Esther. And I asked one of my colleagues at, at the law firm about, who's Jewish about this feast, and he said that when, it, when that feast happens, it's, it's a very joyous event, but all the children are given these noisemakers, and the entire book of Esther is read, and any time the, the name Haman comes up, the children hit those noisemakers with an object to drown out the name of Haman. Um, and that's how they, what they think of Haman. Uh, well, we're not told why Haman was honored in this way. Um, but it's very interesting that right at the very moment when we would expect Mordecai to be honored, instead Haman is honored, right? We'd expect Mordecai to get some kind of honor here. He'd been recorded in the book. He just saved the king's life, but silence on Mordecai. Instead, we see Haman being, being honored instead. In fact, Haman is promoted to be second only to the king, while Mordecai appears to go unrewarded for having saved the king's life. When Haman is introduced here, he's identified as an Agagite. And if you're circling important words in the book of Esther, there's one to circle, Agagite. It may be the most important word in the book for explaining what happened here. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, this, this reference to Haman's nationality, it hints at a conflict uh, that by this time was already centuries old. Can you imagine people in this, in this area of the world carrying on conflicts over a century old? Yeah, we can imagine that. It's going on today. Uh, the roots of the conflict today go back much further than that. Uh, Agag was the king of the Amalekites uh, at the time of Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel. In fact, you will recall that when Mordecai was introduced, he was introduced as a Benjamite whose ancestor was Kish. Well, King Saul was a Benjamite whose ancestor was Kish. It must have been a different Kish, the, the timing's off, but they did have someone in their ancestry named Kish, and they were both Benjamites. That was told to us for a reason. It was foreshadowing what we're seeing right here, that the villain in this book is an Agagite. The Amalekites had the dubious distinction of being the first nation to try to attack and destroy God's people when they entered the Promised Land. In response, God told Moses that he would completely destroy the Amalekites and he would be at war with them from generation to generation. Uh, that's in Exodus chapter 17. Balaam's oracle in Numbers 24 uh, predicted that the Israelite king would be greater than Agag, which by that time had become the, the name of the Amalekite king, like a Caesar. They were called the Agag. Uh, later, God instructed King Saul to attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything and everybody, including the king. Uh, Saul did attack them in 1 Samuel 15, but you'll recall he spared the life of King Agag, and he kept the best of the sheep and the best of the cattle. Uh, and that, of course, was in disobedience to God's command. Samuel shows up, he curses Saul, he cuts Agag up into pieces. Samuel takes care of it and does what God had told King Saul to do. 
God's promise to be at war with the Amalekites in every generation was given to Moses during the time of the Sinai Covenant. There must have been some questions going through the minds of the Jews at this time. Would, would that promise still stand for Jews living in the exile? Jews that had been exiled for violating that same covenant? Could they expect God to remain faithful to those promises when they had not remained faithful to their own promises to him? There are a lot of questions, a lot of history posed by that simple word, agagite. Agagite, and we'll talk more about it later as we start to see what happens between Haman and Mordecai. Verses 2 and two through 4, again we're in chapter 3 of Esther. In the first chapter we saw an example of respect commanded and respect refused with Queen Vashti. Here we're going to see a second example of that. Respect commanded and respect refused. Why did Mordecai refuse to honor Haman? That kicks off this whole, whole sequence of events. Why did he do that? Why did he not honor Haman? Well, some have suggested that maybe Mordecai resented Haman for being promoted when Mordecai had not been, and he apparently got, not gotten any honor for having saved the king's life. Um, but that seems a little unlikely as we continue on in the book and find out a little more about Mordecai. In the Greek version of Esther, you'll recall that we said the Greeks came in later and added a bunch of stuff that was not in the inspired text. In the Greek version, Mordecai explains that he refused to bow down to, to Haman because he did not want to give glory to anyone but God, did not want to give glory to any man. But it's known from other sources that other Jews did, in fact, bow down to pagan officials in the Persian court uh, because it was not seen much as a religious act, as more an act of honor. Uh, in fact, our own president today has bowed down to Saudi Arabian king. He's bowed down to a Japanese emperor. In fact, he bowed down to the mayor of Tampa, Florida. So may, I guess he's also showing honor in that way. Um, but if it, it, Mordecai, if he, he was also an official, right? He was an official in the court. He must have honored the king. You would not stay an official in this court very long if you didn't honor the king. So I think he must have bowed down to the king. That tells me there's maybe something else going on here. I think the correct answer as to why he did not bow down to, to the Agagite, Haman, is most likely the same one supported by Jewish tradition. And that is that no self-respecting Benjamite would ever show reverence to an ancestor of Agag, an Amalekite. It would never happen. That is why Saul had lost the throne was because of that. Uh, it could have been due to religious scruples. That's another very, poss very strong possibility. Uh, but, but even the Persian king did not demand his subjects worship him. We see that with other kings. We see that with the Roman emperors, for example. We do not see that with the Persians. So I think the most likely reason is that ancient animosity between the tribe of Benjamin in particular, Israel in general, and the Amalekites, Agag. Why else does the text specifically tell us the ancestry of Haman? I think, that, I think the text is telling us that's the reason. Um, Whatever the reason was, the, the text doesn't tell us, and it was not obvious to his colleagues there in the king's gate because they asked him, you know, why don't you bow down to Haman? They wanted to know. Um, the final phrase in verse 4 says he had told them he was a Jew. So, in fact, he had told them his ancestry. Um, uh, and I think that also hints, perhaps, at the ancient animosity between the Jews and the Amalekites. Identification with God's people can cause hardships. That was true then, that's true today. And Mordecai has made that identification here in verse 4. We don't know who else knows or who else knew or when they knew, but these people in verse 4 now know. Um, Haman is cert certainly knows, we'll see that. Uh, Esther had not done this. Uh, she was remaining undercover. Uh, but her opportunity to do so is coming. Verses 5 through 6. Haman's pride, Haman's hunger for power uh, causes him to become filled with fury at Mordecai's refusal to bow down to him. Notice the difference here in, in how the text describes Mordecai, Esther, and Haman. With Mordecai and Esther, we're left to wonder what they're thinking. We don't know what they're thinking. 
The text doesn't tell us what they're thinking. Why did Mordecai not bow down to Haman? We're not told. Uh, What did Esther feel about in chapter 2 when she was suddenly thrust into the king's bedroom? We don't know. We're not told. With Haman, we're told. We have no doubt about how Haman feels. He is filled with fury. Uh, Haman is allowed no mysteries in the book of Esther. We're told what he's thinking. Uh, Rather than attack Mordecai alone, which may also hint that Mordecai has a pretty powerful position here, Uh, Haman decides to go the back roads. He's thinking, well, you know, Mordecai has just told people he's a Jew. Maybe Haman had just learned that himself. Who knows? Uh, But maybe he's thinking the king doesn't know Mordecai is a Jew. So I'll go through the back door and get the king to issue an edict against the Jews, and that will take uh, take Mordecai out as well. So he decides to wipe out Mordecai's entire race. Um, Whatever we say about Esther and Mordecai, as I've said, Mordecai's Jewishness was known. Haman knew about it. Uh, Esther's was not. I think that also explains why they were there about to start speaking through intermediaries. Esther and Mordecai do not speak face to face. I think we all picture that that wonderful uh, interchange between the two that we're coming to. That did not occur face to face. That was through intermediaries. Um, And that's because Queen Esther herself was at this time, her Jewishness was not known. And they were still keeping that a secret. Um, I think perhaps that her Jewish ancestry was not known tells us something about her as well, about Queen Esther. One commentator, I think, said it well. He said, for the masquerade to last that long, Esther must have done more than eat, dress, and live like a Persian. She must have worshipped like a Persian ever think about that? If she had decided not to to worship like the other Persians, I think people would have figured out pretty fast what her ancestry was. So I think think we're seeing Esther as having a foot in each camp, and I think that's how the text wants us to see Esther, as this big decision is coming up. Uh, And before we become too judgmental about Queen Esther, perhaps we should examine our own lives. Uh, You know, are we also hiding our identity from the world while we eat, dress, live, and worship like the Persians? Uh, Sadly, I think that may be true of some of us. Incredibly, some commentators come to this passage and they argue that genocide, this genocide is so improbable by Haman that this book must be fiction. You know, it's because of arguments like that that professors get the the reputation of living in isolated ivory towers uh, apart from reality. Genocide is so incredible, it's fictitious. I mean, we could only hope that were the case. There have been genocides throughout the world's history, including in our own time, including in our own day. There are attempted genocides of entire races of people. The Jews in our own day and time, all throughout Africa in our own day and time. This is hardly something that makes this book improbable. In fact, even in Haman's day, it was not that incredible. We've talked about Smyrtus, the imposter who came up, up as king for a small period of time. Uh, his, his people, where he came from, when he was put down, every Persian in the capital took up weapons and killed every one of his people that they could find at that time. We have examples of genocide even at that time. Hardly improbable. You know, maybe we should pause for just a moment and talk a little bit about anti-Semitism because this book tells us a lot about that. Uh, And that certainly is something that continues up until this present time. And the sad fact is that anti-Semitism has often been linked with Christianity. And that is something that we in the church can never condone. Um, Here's a quote. Let me give you this quote. It's about the Jews, and see if you can tell me who said it. I'll give you a hint. It was said by a very famous German. First, set fire to their synagogues or their schools and to bury and cover them with dirt, whatever won't burn. Uh, I advise that their houses be razed and destroyed. I advise that all their prayer books be taken from them. I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach on pain of loss of life and limb. I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. That Hitler? Was that from the Nuremberg Laws? No. That quote is from Martin Luther, another famous German, one Hitler looked on with admiration we are told. Samuel Sam Detmel has written the following. He said, the organized massacres in Eastern Europe from which my parents fled began with the ringing of church bells. He says, I remember as an American boy how my mother used to shiver whenever the bells rang in the church near our home. 
That's very sad. It's a very sad commentary. Certainly we know what our attitude should be toward the Jewish race or toward any race, any race. As far as the church is concerned, there are only two groups of people in the world, those in Christ and those out of Christ. That's it. Those are the two groups in the world. And in the church, there is no Jew nor Greek, Colossians 3.11. There are two groups in the world, in Christ and out of Christ. And if we start making other groups, we've gone far away from God's plan. Verses 7 through 11. We're now in the 12th year of the king's reign. That means Esther has been queen for five years. She's been reigning as queen for five years when Haman convinced the king to go along with his evil plan. Uh, Haman, uh, es- Esther had been undercover for quite a long period of time, and no one knew she was Jewish, at least no one in the Persian court. This was more than a century after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. This was more than 60 years after the first return to Jerusalem that we studied about in the beginning of our lessons in, uh, from Ez- Ezra. This is less than, 30, less than 20 years until Ezra himself returns, and we'll study that when we get back to Ezra chapter 7. To determine the time for this attack, Haman consults the poor, P-U-R, plural, Purim, the Hebrew form uh, of that same word is also given here. It means a lot or dice. Uh, Archaeologists have unearthed these Purim and found them to be little clay cubes with with cuneiform on the sides that would tell them what to do when the, the face of the cube turned up. Uh, The difference is they were not used for gambling as they're used today. Instead, they were used for divination. Uh, Both Herodotus and Xenophon write about this Persian custom of using these dice to make important decisions. Uh, Verse 7, as I mentioned, gives us the Hebrew word for lot, which is goral. Uh, Psalm 16, verse 5, uses that same word. Uh, David praised God because you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. That's the same word. You, God, have made my lot secure. Uh, David praised God because it was God, not chance or luck, who had made him secure. Uh, You know, sometimes I wonder if when we look at whatever we've accomplished, if we're sometimes tempted to say, boy, weren't we lucky? No. Look at Psalm 16, verse 5. Um, We see in these verses one of the themes we discussed earlier. That clash of world views between the pagan fatalism and between those who trust and fear in God. Uh, we know that God is at work, uh, but like Esther and like Mordecai, we can't always see the end of, the, the end of things from the middle. Uh, they didn't know how it was going to turn out uh, at that time. But, but, but we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's the difference. That's the difference. We're walking by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Haman cast these lots in the first month. We talked about that in the introduction. For something that's going to happen almost a year later. That's when the dice came up. They gave the Jews almost a year in which to prepare. Uh, I think that shows us the providence of God. Right? This could have turned up the next day. But no, they had almost a year to prepare. And that may tell us quite a bit about how God works in the world through his providence. Did he override Haman's free will? No. But did he maybe have a hand in determining how those dice came up? Yeah, those Jews had a year in which to prepare for this. When Haman goes to the king, he has a mixture of truth and error and exaggeration all put together as he makes his case before the king to convince the king to destroy the Jews. Uh, He tells the king that these these people disobey all the laws, uh, even though, in fact, uh, Mordecai had only disobeyed one law. Uh, He also says that this this people, the Jews, are scattered throughout all the provinces. And although they they were fairly widespread, I think that's probably an exaggeration. I don't think they were throughout all the provinces, probably. Um, Haman's charges, though, against the Jews were based on one thing in particular. They were different, he tells the king. They're different. They have different laws. They have different customs. This is a different people. Uh, Anyone who takes God's word seriously is going to be seen as different. Uh, in, in Esther's day and in our own day. Uh, but we must notice that Esther herself, it would seem, had not been very different uh, because her ancestry had remained hidden. Not even Haman knew that. Uh, so that, again, may tell us Esther had a foot in each camp here. Um, Haman knew that his promise in verse 9 would sway the king to his side. It was a promise of money, promise of money. 
You'll remember that uh, Xerxes had come back almost bankrupt from his disastrous campaign against Greece. Um, and so this probably rang a bell with him that, hey, I might get some money out of this. Um, uh, Haman presumably planned to plunder the Jewish uh, wealth uh, when, when, um, uh, when he ordered them all killed. As we talked about in Ezra, there was a lot of wealth that went back, and I imagine there was even more wealth that stayed behind. By giving Haman the signet ring in verse 10, uh, the king was giving him unlimited authority to do whatever he wanted to do on this issue. Um, neither he nor Haman appear to have had any idea that Queen Esther was a member of this troublesome group. Uh, they don't seem to have known that at all. Uh, and notice that Haman never one time mentions the Jewish people by name before the king. We don't even know if the king knew he was talking about the Jews at this time. He never mentions them by name. That may have been because Xerxes' two predecessors, Cyrus and, and Darius, had issued proclamations favorable to the Jews. So he may have wondered how Xerxes felt about the Jews, and he may have also not even really wanted to tell Xerxes who this was targeted against. Now, you would think the king would ask before ordering a genocide. But, you know, I guess he was busy that day or something. He didn't even ask. And later, we're going to find out, it, it seems to have escaped his memory that he did this at all. Um, some surmise that Xerxes may have been looking for a scapegoat. You know, everyone's blaming me about this Greek thing. And they've even tried to kill me about this Greek thing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could find someone else to blame and get their hatred against someone else for a while? Does that sound familiar? Well, I think he may have been looking for a scapegoat. And if so, as always, the people of God step up to be the scapegoat. We saw that in our study of Revelation, didn't we? When Nero was setting fire to the city and looking around for a scapegoat, who did he find? The church. The church. People of God often find themselves in the scape, scapegoat role. Um, and, in, and in verse 11, Haman hears something that must have been music to his ears. The money is given to you, the king says. Now, it's certain the king still expected his cut. But he said, Haman, you get the money. and You do with it what you want to do with it. Um, later in chapter 7, verse 4, Esther will confirm that her people had been sold. Sold. It would not be the last time that God's people had been sold, would it? That 30 pieces of silver is still changing hands today, isn't it? The king's permission in verse 11 to Haman, that he do with them as it seems good to you, that's going to be paralleled later in chapter 9, verse 5, when the Jews are told to do what they would unto those that hated them. That's the reversal. So there's a parallel to this statement in, in verse 11 that we'll see when we get to chapter 9. Verses 12 through 15. Although Haman will have to wait 11 months for the day on which he's going to attack the Jews, he immediately sends out the decree. He didn't waste any time on that. He gets the paperwork going for the big massacre. The edict is sent out on the 13th day of the first month. That's the eve of Passover. The day before they would have celebrated their freedom from Egyptian bondage, a decree goes out that they all be destroyed. The day before. The decree is made and copies are sent to every province. Chapter 3 ends with what one commentator has called the most horrifying sight in the narrative so far. After the death document has been issued, the king and Haman sit down to drink. It's interesting that verse 15 says the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. That seems to include Jew and non-Jew alike. Everyone seems to have been bewildered by this order. Uh, whether Jewish or not. Perhaps they wisely thought if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. What's going on here? Why are they, go why are they targeted for destruction? We no we've noted already that Esther was very meaningful to the Jews during their times of persecution, but it's also very meaningful to the church, particularly to the early church. And again, I'd point you back to our study of Revelation against the Jewish, the persecution of the church, not the Jews, but the church by the Romans. Uh, that, that lit, was the backdrop to the book of Revelation. And all of those notes and audio, all that's available on the internet, thywordistruth.com. Chapter 4, Esther chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Mordecai shows intense grief over this edict. And, and no doubt, particularly because his personal conflict with Haman had led to this edict. You know, it's one thing to bring persecution down upon yourself personally, personally. 
but he had brought it down upon his entire people by his refusal to bow down to Haman. Now, there's no indication he regretted that, which, which some say, well, maybe that points to the fact, maybe it was for religious reasons, because there's no indication he regretted it. But again, we really don't know what's going on in, Haman's, in, in Mordecai's mind. We're not told. Maybe he did regret it. We're just not told about it. We see the tearing of clothes as a display of grief, and we see that all throughout the Old Testament by Jews, Joshua, Caleb, David, even Ezra. We've seen that. It was also a Persian custom, Herodotus tells us. Um, Mordecai's mourning was duplicated by the Jews wherever the edict reached. They also mourned for this horrible edict. Of course, they had no way to know what caused it. Did you ever wonder about that? I mean, suddenly the edict shows up demanding they all be killed. They must have wondered why. What had we done? Uh, I may have been the only Jew who knew what had triggered this edict. It's, it's possible he later tells Esther. We'll talk about that in a moment. But at this time, he may have been the only one who knew what had really caused this. Um, given the length of time between the edict and, and the lack of enacting the edict, um, we're going to see that something else happens pretty fast. But it's possible that if the edict had carried, been carried out, that you would have seen a lot more Jews deciding they wanted to go back to Jerusalem than had gone the first time. That might, start, might have looked a lot better to them now that this edict had gone out. That may have also been a reason they were given so much time. Verse 11 includes the phrase with fasting and weeping and lamenting. You'll find that same phrase in Joel 2, verse 12. In fact, there's some very interesting parallels between what we're reading here and what we find in Joel 2, verse 12 and following. Um, I won't go through that here for lack of time, but that's in the notes. You can see some very interesting parallels with Joel chapter 2. The reference to fasting without any reference to prayer is very unusual. It's certainly intentional because you would just expect to see prayer here, and you don't. You don't see it here. Now, as we said, it may be that the author is omitting this reference to God to highlight God working behind the scenes through his providence. But even so, you could mention prayer, couldn't you? Because we pray and we also rely on the providence of God. Another possibility is that, that these exiled Jews had moved so far away from God that maybe they didn't pray anymore. Maybe even in this hour of crisis, they did not turn to God in prayer. And some commentators point to that as a possibility, a sad possibility. Um, you know, if, if someone asked me, what's the surest sign of someone who has drifted or is drifting away from the church and away from God and away from Christ? I think I'd point to two things. First, I would point to that person no longer delighting in God's Word. If it's just boring to them, just tedium to them, they're drifting. They've drifted. But I'd also point to a failure to pray. Failure to pray to God as the sure sign, maybe the surest sign that you've left and you've, you've gone and you're drifting. Um, one, someone wrote, prayerlessness is an insult to God. Every prayerless day is a statement by a helpless individual. I do not need God today when you fail to pray. Another writes, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toils. He mocks at our wisdom. But he trembles when we pray. And finally, another writes, apostasy begins in the closet. No man ever backslid from the life and power of Christianity who continued constant and fervent in private prayer. Prayer. And we don't see these people praying, do we? These verses are at a low point here in the narrative. Death seems certain unless a deliverer can be found. But who could that be? Verse 4 answers the question. Verses 4 and 5. The remainder of chapter 4 presents three stages in the dialogue between Esther and Mordecai. And again, it's with intermediaries between the two. Esther was deeply distressed when she learned of Mordecai's grief. She and Mordecai were still very close, even though... The secrecy had been maintained between them. The eunuch who delivers this message must have been very trusted by Queen Esther to maintain that secret. Verses 6 through 8, Mordecai was well informed, again hinting that he's an official of some sort. He knew even the details of the money. He says he knew the exact sum. He knew what had happened here. 
Uh, Mordecai even sends Esther a copy of the decree so she could see it for herself and know that he was not exaggerating. Mordecai instructs the eunuch to command Esther to go to the king and plead with him on behalf of her people. Who were her people? Isn't that the question of the book? Who were her people? Was she Jewish or was she Persian? And if she had one foot in each camp, into which camp would she jump when the time for decision came? And maybe we could ask ourselves that question. And if she did what Mordecai commanded, then her secret would be out. And wasn't Mordecai the one who had told her to keep it a secret? Hadn't he given the opposite command earlier in the book? If Esther now obeyed Mordecai's new command, she might find herself on the wrong side of that edict. Uh, revealing her identity would make her an easy target in this treacherous Persian court. All of this must have been going through her mind. But we're not told what she was thinking. Courage was called for. How would she respond? She's faced with a decision. Was she Esther or was she Hadassah, her other name, her Jewish name? Who were her people? Esther was having an Esther moment. And we all need to pray that we will be given Esther moments. Moments when we can stand up and announce to the world who our people are. She had that moment. Every Christian has had at least one Esther moment in their life. Every Christian. Because every Christian has obeyed the gospel to be added to the church. And obedience to the gospel is an Esther moment. Making the decision putting your, your feet down firmly in the camp of God and saying, these are my people. The church, that's my people. That's an Esther moment. But we as Christians should hope we will have those throughout our lives. And every time we do, we will make that same good confession and say, these are my people. The church, that's an Esther moment. And we need to pray that we will have those. Those choices are what define us. That's what defines us. That choice answers the question, who are your people? And they will come throughout our lives. And they will often come unexpectedly. They will often pass by quickly. And we may find ourselves looking back with regret on that Esther moment. And maybe our failure to announce whose side we're on. They come by quickly. We need to be looking for them. We need to be praying for them. That we will have them. They define who we are, and they don't just come to individual Christians. Esther moments come to congregations of Christians. Congregations have Esther moments and Esther decisions to make all the time. And we see congregations around us in this city who have had their Esther moment and who have announced to the world, we're on the side of Persia. Verses 9 through 11. Esther reminds Mordecai of the Persian law that forbids anyone to approach the king without first being called. Under that law, such a person would be killed unless the king first held out his golden scepter. And Esther had not been called for 30 days. Herodotus confirms the Persians had such a law. He also adds that it would be possible to send the king a note and request permission to come before the king. And we're not told why Esther did not do that. Um, perhaps it would have taken too long. Uh, perhaps the risk was too great the king would say no. We're not told. Under ordinary circumstances, Esther might not have had much fear in approaching the king unannounced or much of, much had less fear. But these are hardly ordinary circumstances, are they? Uh, this edict has just gone out against all the Jews. Uh, Esther may be thinking to herself, maybe the king knows I'm a Jew. Maybe the secret is already out. I mean, who knows? Um, that's a possibility. Verse 7 may suggest that Mordecai had told Esther what had caused the decree to be issued, but we're not certain of that. Remember that these events were taking year, place five years after Esther had become queen. Um, and she had not been called for 30 days. Uh, so maybe the king's affection for her had cooled. She may be thinking, well, maybe the king is ready for another queen. Maybe the king is just looking for an excuse to have me killed. And if I march in there unannounced, I mean, that, that's an excuse, all right. And maybe he'll just have me killed and go on to the next queen. Verses 12 through 14. Mordecai's only recorded words appear in these verses. And they leave us with a number of intriguing questions. 
From where or from whom would this other deliverance come if Esther failed to act? And why was Mordecai so certain that Esther would perish if she failed to act? After all, her identity seemed to still be a secret among the Persian court. Mordecai tells Esther she is in danger no matter what she does. She's in danger if she acts. She's in danger if she fails to act. Uh, Apparently, Mordecai felt certain her secret would not be maintained for very long. Others already knew who she was. The other Jews did, certainly. Verse 16, I think, tells us that. And once the killing started, they would also likely turn to her for help. So I don't think her secret would have remained secret very long. But when you look at Mordecai's statement to Esther, it's a little unsettling if you look at it very closely. Uh, He understands her life may be in peril if she acts, but he's certain she's going to perish if she fails to act. Was he invoking a divine judgment upon her if she failed to act? Or was he perhaps threatening to reveal her identity as a Jew? Uh, Some commentators look at this and say there's a little blackmail going on here. I don't think so, but some commentators look at this verse and think so. How did Esther understand it? We're not told. We're not told what was going through Esther's mind here. Uh, As for the identity uh, identity of this other deliverer, uh, commentators have long seen an allusion to God in that. Uh, But some commentators say, well, the thought is either Esther will save them or God will save them. That's not the thought. God was saving them through Esther. The thought is either God would save them through Esther or God would save them through someone else. God is saving them. So I think uh, certainly if it's providence, it's not God or someone else. It's God acting through this person or it's God acting through some other person. Um, And there's certainly a lesson here for us. We can't avoid danger by remaining silent. Uh, In fact, maybe we too are in more danger if we remain silent and inactive, like Esther. And finally, we come to perhaps the key question in the book. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Mordecai suggests there's a purpose behind this, Queen Esther. You may be wondering why you come to this position. You may be wondering why you found yourself in Persia. You may be wondering why you found yourself in Susa. You may be wondering why you found yourself in the harem. You may be wondering why you found yourself in the king's bedroom. The answer may be that God has put you there for a purpose, for a reason. And this is it. The time for decision has come. Mordecai's question, I think, reveals a deep conviction in God's providence, an understanding that God's providence works through the action of individuals. Yes, God would save his people, but he would do so through the courage and through the faithfulness of Queen Esther, or he would find someone else. Could God have sent an army of angels to wipe Persia off the face of the earth? Yes. Was that what God did then? Was that how he worked then? No. Is that how he works today? No. He works today the same way we see him working in the book of Esther, which is one reason why Esther is such a modern book. He works through us. God could have sent an army of angels. He did not. He does not today because he has an army. We are his army. The church is his army. And if we lay our weapons down, who will fight for him? If we fail to act, who will act? That's our Esther moment. When the world presents us an opportunity to stand up and say, we are in the Lord's army. And that's not just a VBS song. That's something we should say every day. Through our words, through our actions, through our deeds, everything should be announcing to the world, we're on the Lord's side. We're in the Lord's army. And when the fight comes, that's who we're going to be fighting for. We are not in the camp of Persia. Esther has come to the point when she has been called on to make that decision and to announce which side she's on. An Esther moment. And this is the key part of this book. It's revolving around this, around her decision, around her response to this question. Who knows, but you were brought here for this. And we see that in our own lives, don't we? When things come in our own lives, we may wonder, how did we come to this position? How did we get in this job? How did I get in this position in my job? How did I find myself in this meeting? How did this happen? Who knows, but maybe your whole life has been leading up to that event. And everyone, God included, is looking at you to see how you will decide that question.
Next week, we'll pick up in verse 15. Thank you very much for your attention.